Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. Hope you're doing great on this great day to be alive. Hope you're doing something interesting, health-affirming, getting some sun on your face, but wearing that mask when you're in crowded public places. Hey, if you get tan lines, it'll be a thing. It'll be a status symbol because you're the person who is both outdoors, getting it on, and also taking care of yourself and those around you. So rock the mask, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, I've got a great interview to share with you today. It's with a guy named Paul Sullivan. He is the Wealth Matters reporter for the New York Times. That's right, New York Times. Big deal. Big deal. I get the big people. What can I say? They know where the audience is. They know where the smart people listen while they're running or walking their dog or roller skating roller skate. Everybody's roller skating these days. That's what's happening. Anyway, Paul's got a book called The Thin Green Line that is very interesting. I loved reading it and we talk in great depth about his work. Give you a little teaser. The Thin Green Line is what he calls the difference between people who are rich and people who are wealthy. The difference between rich and wealthy. Interesting subtleties that we discuss. So stay tuned for that. Before we get to Paul, I want to do a little segment called Listener Mail that I made up. Uh, this is a new segment called Listener Mail that I made up. My first letter, it's a letter, it was written to me. It's written in blue ink. The address, here it is. I've got it right here in my hands. It's from Marge in Toledo. And she asks, Paul, why do you start every episode with It's a Great Day to Be Alive? You know, Marge, I never gave it much thought. When you start a podcast, you don't really know what it's going to turn into. And this thing has kind of turned into me helping remind myself that every day matters and that the things in life that matter are not necessarily the financial things past a certain point. I want to be very clear about that, that it's really easy to say that it's not about the money when you have enough money, but it's really important to have a conscious relationship with money, especially along the lines of what Paul Sullivan and I talk about today, because knowing what you want from money will influence how you spend it, where you invest it, and the kinds of things that you want to empower in your life using money. Anyway, that's kind of how like I start by saying, like, let's make sure that we have our objectives in life clear, that it's not about being rich, it's about leading lives of meaning. That's kind of where that came from. Wow, we got deep in a hurry already, man. This this new segment is hot. I like it. All right. Oh, this is an interesting one. This is an airmail. It's one of those thin letters, and it's from Finland where Crazy Money is ranked number 105 in Apple Podcasts slash careers. So I'm getting a pretty big following in Finland. This is from Roger in Finland. R Roger? Anyway, Paul, why did you start Crazy Money? Well, interesting question, Roger. It's along the lines of what I was just talking about with Marge there from Toledo. Maybe you guys know each other. I don't know. I started it because I fetishized money my whole life. And then when I finally made some, it was, uh, it was, it was uninspiring that when I quit my job and I retired early, I realized that a lot of what I was getting from work was non-financial. I missed my friends. I missed having a sense of purpose. I missed having knowledge and fluency in a space where I also had a good answer to the question, what do you do? I have it again, by the way, because I like saying that I write books, I do a podcast, and I'm a comedian. So I like having that answer. So thanks for the email. Uh, oh, no, the mail, the very real mail that I just read, Roger. This next one, the last one is a postcard. It's from Pikes Peak in Colorado, and it's written in red crayon. It says, Paul, I am a fourth grader at the St. Joe's High School. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you be a fourth grader in high school? Paul, I'm a fourth grader at the St. Joe's Elementary School in Denver, Colorado, what should I do if I want to grow up and make a lot of money? Well, I forgot who signed. I couldn't read the signature. That's why I didn't say who it was from. That's a great question there, Danny from Denver, Colorado. If you want to make a lot of money, I would study hard, study real hard and uh, be nice to people. That's my advice to you. And then as you get older, you'll figure it out. Well, there we go. I think that was pretty good. I think that segment is going to stay. I might work on it a little harder before I do the next one, but we're going to keep going with that. Hey, let's go back to what Marge was talking about and why I did the show and what Paul Sullivan, our guest today, why what he writes about matters. This is a theme that human beings have dealt with for thousands of years. It goes back to the Stoics and Epictetus, who said that wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. 
And there is no more profound statement that I have ever run across than that. That really in life, we are as wealthy as, as long as we have our very basic needs met, we're as wealthy as we want to consider ourselves. And that money can be gained by trading some things for other things. And it all really matters about what you value. And Paul Sullivan wrote a whole book about it. And it's called The Thin Green Line. We talk about it today. And as I mentioned before, it's all about the difference between what rich people do versus what wealthy people do. And I'll let him dive into it. But one of the things that really matters that we talk about is understanding your wants from your needs and controlling your appetites such that the way you spend your money results in the most happiness and security that you can get. And I will let Mr. Sullivan go in depth from there. So let me tell you a little bit more about him. Paul Sullivan writes the Wealth Matters column for the New York Times and is the author of The Thin Green Line, The Money Secrets of the Super Wealthy. In his book, he discusses the important differences between being rich and being wealthy. Hint for you, one means that you have a lot of money, the other means that you have control over your financial life. Paul grew up in a working class family, but won a scholarship to an elite boarding school and experienced that changed his life. Then after earning degrees at Trinity College and University of Chicago, he began a journalism career reporting for Bloomberg, the Financial Times, and other top publications. In our conversation, Paul shares how his experience growing up in a cash-strapped home both drove his fascination with people of means and molded his personal financial values. One writer said of his book, it is a welcome antidote to the idea that wealth is simply a number on a bank statement. I found it to be both actually funny in many places, but also way more interesting and readable than the other 99% of personal finance books out there. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you will listen closely to him so that you will end up on the right side of the thin green line. This is Paul Sullivan. Entrepreneurs who become successful, one of the things they try to do is hide their wealth from their children. But it makes money something that it shouldn't be. I mean, money is a means of exchange. We all have psychological baggage around money. This heightens the money, particularly in this day and age when you can go online on Zillow and say, Dad, if we're broke, how come our house is worth $11 million? You know, <laughs> Dad, if we're broke, I just looked at the you know, resale market for a Gulfstream. We could sell that for like $23 million, Dad. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Paul Sullivan, welcome to Crazy Money. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> uh, that was it that was it that was the opening man that was the big opening are you kidding me i'm sorry <laughs> come on paul all right ladies and gentlemen from the new york times please welcome paul sullivan it's gonna be a good day we got two pauls talking today there you go paul what is the thin green line and why does it matter it's two things one is the title of my last book but It's more than that. It's the line that divides people who are rich from people who are wealthy. And when you think about it, if you think about an S&P 500 chart, which even, you know, during the coronavirus went down, but it's gone back up. You look at it in 1980, starts low, a lot higher now in 2020 than it was then. People who are on top of that line are people who I call wealthy. Now, they may be a school teacher down toward the bottom of the income level, but a school teacher who has control over her life, who can manage the choices she wants, or it could be the CEO of a company or or hedge fund manager or whatever at the very top. But the other side are people who are either rich or poor. So down below that line, obviously, you have people who are struggling to get by. They don't have as many choices. They're just trying to subsist. But you also have people who are making enormous amounts of money who shouldn't have a financial care in the world but they make such poor choices over and over again that their life is far more precarious for their income than it ever should be. And in some ways, far more precarious than that teacher on the right side of the thin green line who's made much better choices. So bad choices like quitting your job at Facebook and pursuing a dream of being a stand-up comedian. Choices like that? Is that what you're talking about? Horrible. Uh, (laughs) If only I knew you then, I would have said, don't do it. Stop. You could be the funny guy at work. You know what I learned is that when your colleagues encourage you to chase your dream, at least one of them wants your job. That's what I, it's, it's a true thing. It's Mike Randall. Uh, look him up on LinkedIn. He's a real person. Okay. So what you're saying is I can have a lot of money and still be poor. No, you'd be rich. You could have a lot of money or you would be poor. The amount of money matters, 
But it's a difference of, are you going to make the choices in your life that you want to? Are you going to decide, I've had enough of Facebook, I've made enough money, I'm going to go become a stand-up comedian. You're wealthy by definition, but you have the freedom to make that choice. There could be somebody who had just as many stock options or however you were paid who can't do that because he bought an enormous house. Then he bought another enormous house. Then he got into collecting cars. He happened to love Ferraris. So now he's got 10 Ferraris. That guy doesn't have choice. He's rich. He has a lot of assets. But if he suddenly wants to go pursue his dream and become a stand-up comedian, it's not going to happen because he has too many financial obligations that need to be funded by that job at Facebook. So by my definition, not knowing you that well, I would guess that you are wealthy because you are able to chart a different path in your life and not worry about somebody else controlling your, your destiny. Well, I did have a conversation not long ago with my wife about beautiful mountain home that in this area where it's 20 degrees cooler, two hours away in North Carolina. We both looked at it. We both loved it. We both wanted to Cashier. dive in. What's that? Cashers. Cashier? Yeah, yeah, cashers. Yeah. They're redoing this old resort and they're building a killer golf course with the people from Blackberry Farms managing. And we both really wanted it. And then we sat down with our financial people and we realized either I can go back to work, we can put the kids in public school, or we can have a mountain house. I mean, one of those things has to happen to afford the mountain house, but we can't do all those things. Yeah. So those are the conversations we do engage in because we've made choices because we want to stay on the right side of that green line. So you shafted the kids. and <laughs> So the kids are, they are being homeschooled, but that's a totally unrelated <laughs> issue. <laughs> now you've seen how easy it is to educate your kids via Zoom. You're like, well, might as well buy the mountain house. Yeah, oh. right, right. So I think we'll just get good Wi-Fi and we'll do it <laughs> from home in the mountains. Did you write this partially because there's not enough talk about the dangers of spending relative to how much people are making out there? No, I, I wrote it because I hate personal finance books that are prescriptive, that tell you, you know, don't buy that cup of Starbucks coffee. If you put that $4 in your savings for the next 47 years, you'd have a million dollars. I don't know if that math's correct, but, but obviously if you put $4 a day in savings, you would have more money at the end, but you wouldn't necessarily be happy. So this is more about being conscious about the money you have and making the choices that will help you, you know, live the life you want. And that means not always being able to do everything. I mean, most personal finance books are diets and they sound great. It's like, I'm going to go on the keto diet. I'm going to cut out sugar. I'm going to do this and I'm going to lose weight. And of course you will, you will, you'll hundred percent. If you follow it, you'll lose weight. But after like three months, you're going to say, screw this. This isn't any fun. I don't want to be on this. And you're going to go get a margarita and an ice cream cone. And next thing you know, 20 pounds are right back on. You get your fat clothes on. This is changing your perception of life. I mean, there are only four things you can do with money. You can save it. You can spend it. You can give it away. And you can think about it. You can't do anything else with money that you have than those things. So if you start to categorize that, you know, what is important to you? You know, we're joking about your kid's education. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's important to you. But <laughs> that's important. pretty important, yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever. But they made it halfway there in good schools. You know, do a test. Put one in a bad school and keep the other in private school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Run my own longitudinal test with their lives. And <laughs> what could go wrong? I'm sure they'll love you both equally in the end. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> But that's a choice. And so right there, you're thinking with that wealth mentality of, I can't have these two things. I can't have the house and my kids in the school as I want them to be, unless I go back to Facebook or some company like Facebook. Unless you really want to do that, well, that's great. Go ahead and, and do that. But you're at least aware of why you have to do it. You're not being forced to do it because you didn't go to your financial advisor and you bought the house and you're like, isn't this great? And then you called in a decorator and you're like, what? It's <laughs> $50,000 for a set of drapes, but th th I don't even care. It's like, but that's just one window. Why is it 50? How can drapes be so expensive? Then you got to go back to work. The first time I worked with a real decorator that was seared in my brain for quite some time. <laughs> You know, we're talking about education. We're joking around a little bit, but you do talk about education in your book is something that potentially rich people overinvest in. How does that work? Well, I don't know necessarily if they invest in it the right way. You know, the, the goal isn't, I mean, maybe it's after the coronavirus. I, I don't know. But the, when I wrote the book, the goal isn't to, you know, go cheap, 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 and then try to get them into the best private high school you can get them into, and then try to get them into the best college you can. And, and we just saw, you know, one of those people, I won't name her, uh, in that scandal just pled guilty today 
for buying her child's way into college by, by making her out to be a rower when she was not a rower. Ethical, moral dilemma there, probably not the best example you're setting. But in the book, I argue that if we could all do this, people with money, people without money, and invest in the earliest years of our child's education, early being like age three to eight, which puts you in the clear with your nine-year-old and your 10-year-old. They're done. They're messed it up. It either worked or it didn't. I mean, that's <laughs> it. You just, right. You to get the house. But those are the foundational years. And there's been all kinds of studies. There's the famous Nobel Prize winning economist named Heckman. He was, won the Nobel Prize for this obscure, completely obscure thing. And after he had the prize in his pocket, he said, let's do something interesting. And he did these tests on kids who were given high quality early childhood education. And he took rich kids who got it and rich kids who didn't and poor kids who got it and poor kids who didn't. Now, the poor kids who got the great early childhood education didn't necessarily do as well as the rich kids who got the great early childhood education, but they did a hell of a lot better than the poor kids who didn't. So when you're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, it works. But oftentimes parents think, well, I'm going to skimp and then I'll just save everything for college. But if you don't have that foundation, we've all gone to college and you get there and some kids are really well prepared and some kids are not. And some kids, you know, are in over their heads and some kids aren't. But it's more about that early education is what's going to give you those skills through life to be curious, to be inquisitive, to know that you have to show up on time. And it's crazy to think that a three-year-old, unless you think of, you know, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, Boss Baby, which I watch all the time, my three-year-old, it's amazing, you know. We're creating little boss space, but you're teaching them those life skills and imprinting them super early where it's, it's going to last and carry them through wherever they go education-wise after that. Right. Where do you think some rich people are over-investing, though? I mean, do you think that there's just too much emphasis on the brand name school or the second-tier school that sounds better than the state college or whatever? Uh, I mean, this yeah, this is not an original thought, but this is a, you know, not original to me at least. I mean, there's too much focus on outcomes. Talk to any great athlete. I mean, my first book was all about pressure and why some people did better under pressure than others. And every single person who was great, every single person who was clutch, that was the name of the book, focused on the process. They focused on the process and they didn't focus on the outcome. So if you're saying, if you're deciding between, I don't know, uh, you know I know you're in Atlanta, University of Georgia or Georgia Tech and Emory, they're all great schools, but they're very different. And so, you know, this is a, softball answer, but what's the right school for your kid? I, I hate even saying that, but it's, it's really focusing on that process and not on the outcome because, you know, look, do dumb people graduate from Harvard and get a leg up? Of course it happens all the time, you know, but they're called legacies. But, you know, at a certain point, the smart kid that goes to the state school is still going to be the smart kid that went to the state school and does great. Cause he's going to have curiosity. He's going to be inquisitive. He's going to be passionate about what he does. He's not going to be the guy who I lived in Boston for a while. And I always remember this guy who was in his eighties and he'd say, well, you know, when I was at Harvard and I always wanted to say like, what have you done in the intervening 60 years? I mean, good for you, but it's 60 years between Harvard and now. Yeah. The scene where you open your book is a gathering of some ultra successful people. And all the guys around the table are trying to outdo each other as to who grew up the poorest. <laughs> Yeah. Were these guys ashamed of their success or were they just trying to demonstrate how far they've come? I think they're trying to demonstrate how far they, they, they came. They certainly weren't ashamed of their, their success. It was a highly confident group of individuals. What was interesting is later on, as I got to know more of them, one of the moderators in this group had actually inherited a lot of money from two sort of very storied American families. He, like The families merged. And so he had great wealth on his mother's side, great wealth on his father's side, and he had more than enough money to qualify for this group. But the moderator never wanted to be part of the group because he felt like a pretender. He felt like a fraud because all of these guys had made it themselves. And so the scene I paint in the beginning is, yeah, they're, they're trying to out humble each other. And it gets pretty good. And the guy who wins is this guy whose dad was a taxi driver who got a tip and somehow that gets him into Dartmouth. And then he goes from Dartmouth to several hundred million dollar, you know, real estate fortune. But they all wanted to prove that they did it themselves, that mm. they had gotten handouts, that they had drive, they'd made choices. They weren't oblivious. They all admitted that there's some amount of luck. I mean, you can go to law school and become a lawyer at a corporate firm and make several million dollars a year and, and accumulate tens of millions of dollars in your lifetime. But when you get into the hundreds of millions of dollars and the billions of dollars, 
there ha- you have to admit there's some element of timing and, and luck involved in that. So the group you're referring to is a group called Tiger 21, which is a club for the ultra wealthy. Tell me where it came from and what it does for its members. It was the brainchild of a man named Michael Sonnenfeld, who's gotten wealthy several times in his life in real estate, in merchant banking. And he, they'd probably kill me if they heard me say this, but it's almost like, you know, those investing circles with little old ladies that you read about, like a whole bunch of teachers get together and each throw in $100. And next thing you know, the 12 teachers have, you know, $7.4 million. I want in. I want in on those. And you're like, how did they do it? But it was that idea where it's sort of, not so much wisdom of the crowd, but getting together and being brutally honest with each other. Because unlike those little old ladies in an investing club, nobody is pitching them products. Nobody really wants to talk to the little old ladies because they don't have any money. When you're worth tens of millions of dollars, and you have to have at least 10 million liquid to get into this group, but most of them had in the hundreds, uh, if not high hundreds, you're those people, everybody is pitching you something all the time and it starts to scramble your head. So they use the group, one, to sort of sort through different investment ideas, but two, for the most part, the guys who self-selected in, and this is self-selection, you know, nobody's forcing you to pay $30,000 a year to go have you know, lunch every month with, with 11 guys you don't know, but the ones who self-selected in, they really wanted to understand that other part of wealth, the discussion part. What does this mean for my kids? What does this mean for my estate planning? Should I have certain types of of insurance. Now that I'm so wealthy, I'm kind of a target. How should I look at the properties I have? You know, how should I? So they wanted, they could figure out the financial advice became a bit of a commodity. The emotional advice is what they really valued. And that's how you, they get into these deep conversations, in which they do what they call the portfolio of defense. So 12 guys, one a month, they each kind of lay things bare. Sonnenfeld calls it opening the kimono. Uh, which if you knew Sonnefeld, he's this giant bear of a man, you know, bald. It's not a pretty picture. Um, but <laughs> that was the notion that you would share everything you had and then you'd subject yourself to a bit of tough love and, and they'd tell you, you know, where you got it right, where you got it wrong, but most importantly, how you could change the things that, that you got wrong. These guys weren't getting that from, from their private banker who, who had an idea for a new private equity investment for them. That's kind of what's most interesting to me about it and why I had our mutual friend, Brad Klontz, who is a financial therapist who helps people deal with the effects of making a lot of money. And that seems counterintuitive. Hey, if you make a lot of money, your life's going to be improved drastically. So why should you need any help? But it does seem that these guys have a bond here where they can talk to each other openly and honestly in a way that they could never talk to just some average guy who thinks, well, you've got 10 million bucks. What kind of problems could you possibly have? They're peers and they're all talking to you know, each other. It's like, I don't want to introduce another podcast here and screw things up. Go for it. Alec Baldwin, like whatever people feel about Alec Baldwin, he had this one going, here's the thing. And Alec Baldwin, a super duper celebrity, would interview other super duper celebrities. And what was so fascinating was that they were on the same level. They were peers, but he was also interested in hearing what they had to say. There wasn't that disequilibrium. With Tiger 21, it's the same thing. You know, one of the guys in there, he was a founder of Quick and Riley, which was an early discount brokerage firm that got sold for gajillions of dollars. And he still had all of his friends from New Jersey. Like his dad started it. He was employee number five or six. And you know, he made hundreds of millions of dollars, but he had these buddies that he'd grown up with who he would go out for a beer with, who he'd play golf with, but they wouldn't listen to him. He said, you know, he would try to talk to them about his concerns or problems and they turned to him and say, Les, you're rich. How can you have any problems? And Les was like, yeah, I'm rich, but I got rich guy problems. But in this group, they're all rich guys. And so they can all say, hey, I just try to buy a 150 foot yacht, but can you believe the charter fees these days? And people will say, oh, yeah, I had the same thing. And they can get real advice. The takeaway here for anybody listening is not like for you zone out. It's not like, well, I don't have $150 million. But it's, it's finding your group. It's finding your tribe, your peer group, where you can talk openly and honestly with each other. That's the most important part of this group. They talk openly and honestly to their peers. So there's not this equilibrium where one guy you know, has hundred grand and the other guy has a hundred million. You talk about another group too of peers called resource generation. Who are these folks and what do they have in common? What they have in common is they all inherited money and they don't want it. So this is something that... What? 
Trust me, I, I couldn't figure it out. Lovely people, love talking to them, but couldn't figure it out. And they are voluntarily redistributing their wealth. And they allow people to opt in. So some people have an inherited $500,000, $700,000, you know, nothing to sniff at, but an amount of money most people would say, great, that's going to make my life a little easier. One girl, a woman I talked about, her grandfather created a company that he sold to a conglomerate for more than a billion dollars. I mean, she'll never have to work, nor will any of her children or grandchildren. But she was involved in it to try to give away some of the money. To me, though, this creates a different dynamic. And I don't want to judge them, but their heart was in the right place. They wanted to affect social change. They felt that income inequality was a problem, all of which is 100% true. I, I would agree with that. However, the more I talked to them, I, I felt like they hadn't had families growing up where money was a conversation that you could have openly. I mean, one of the things that over and over again, and it blows my mind that entrepreneurs who become successful, one of the things they try to do is hide their wealth from their children. And I've heard all kinds of crazy stories about people saying, I lost all my money in 2008. I did all this. But it makes money something that it shouldn't be. I mean, money is a means of exchange. We all have psychological baggage around money. This heightens the money, particularly in this day and age when you can go online on Zillow and say, dad, if we're broke, how come our house is worth $11 million? You know, <laughs> dad, if we're broke, I just looked at the you know, resale market for a Gulfstream. We could sell that for like $23 million, dad. And then once you break that trust between, you know, parent and child, you're screwed. This group, and I don't want to paint it with a broad brush, but I always felt like they hadn't had those deep conversations about responsibilities around wealth, what it meant, and most of all, you know, how to be self-motivated, how to take whatever advantage you may have in life and do whatever it is you want. Now, if you want to give away all your money, that's fine. But once it's gone, it's gone. You're not getting it back. Hey, everybody, it's Paul. You know, if you're new to the program, and I know a lot of you are because I see the numbers every week and they're growing very nicely. So thank you for being here. I want to invite you to go back and listen to some of our back episodes because I've had a lot of really great guests. And there's been a lot of different topics covered. And one of my favorite episodes is the episode in which I interviewed my wife, Stacy, about how we talk about money. Every marriage or committed relationship has money challenges. And talking about money is very, very difficult because when you talk about money, you're not just talking about money. You're talking about the values you have, about the way each of you was raised, about who spends what, about who makes what. All those things are baked into conversations about money. And even though we've done very well, Stacy and I still fight about money. It's the number one thing we fight about. So I think you'll find this conversation really interesting. So scroll down only after you've completed listening to this excellent interview with Paul Sullivan, by the way, because I would not diss a gentleman of his esteemed status in any way. So after you finish listening to this episode, scroll down in your episodes and go listen to the November 13th, 2019 episode in which I interview my wife, Stacy. You talk about how you grew up working class. Did the way you grew up make you want to write about money when you got older? hundred percent. But you know, I kind of worked through all kinds of issues myself because at first we were downwardly mobile for quite some time. And I write about this openly in the book until I got a scholarship to a, be a day student at a, a local prep school. And that changed my life. Like I suddenly got out of this crappy neighborhood, saw these other kids. We all had uniforms on, which was a great equalizing force. And then I just put my head down and I, I studied. I did the same thing in college. I did the same thing in graduate school because I just, I wanted to escape. I wanted to get out of where I was. But the problem is that I also had this belief that money was bad. I had associated you know, my own family's downward mobility with money, not with poor choices they made or a little bit of bad luck. And so it took me a long time to work through that. So by the time I got to my late 20s, and you know, I've been at the New York Times for 11 years now, but back then I was at the Financial Times, the British newspaper, I wanted to understand when I created the first wealth column there, I want to understand how people held on to money, how they live with money. I didn't want to write a lifestyles of the rich and famous column where you're like, good God, he has a $300 million yacht. Isn't it wonderful? Right. right. I wanted to write the column that says he has a $300 million yacht, but how much does it cost? How much does it cost to put fuel in it, to charter, to move it around? What is all this stuff? How does it work? How does he think about that in the context? So I wanted to figure out money. And through that, I got really interested in financial psychology and how, you know, 
I came to know our, our mutual friend, you know, Brad Klontz, uh, with whom you know, I've collaborated on some academic papers and done some really interesting stuff about how what he calls, it's his phrase, not mine, these ingrained money scripts, you know, the way deep, deep thinking about money, how it influences all of our decisions, both good and bad, but that most people don't understand that. Most people have no idea what this, you know, internal voice in their head around money is actually saying. And they just wonder, Jesus, how did I just go and spend $500 on shoes? Why would I do that? That was stupid. I regret it. But if you knew why you did it, then you could maybe not, or at least enjoy those $500 pair of shoes. Yeah. It's about developing a conscious relationship. That's what this whole show is about. It's about us trying to figure out what do we want from money and how does it serve us to live the life that we want to live as opposed to designing our life around how do I maximize my income period end of story. I actually wrote, you made a reference to lifestyles of the rich and famous. And I actually have written down here, your column isn't about caviar wishes and champagne dreams, right? <laughs> and wealth isn't something that, you know, if you were an investment reporter, you, maybe you'd write about the market and the market changes every day, but you cover wealth and you talk about everything from travel to architecture and divorce estates and tax law. How do you decide what you're going to write about on any given day or week? I mean, to be honest, I just have pretty diverse interests. And if I wrote about you know, some of them are real news you can use columns. You know, tax columns can be really boring, but they're helpful. You know, I do write about yachts. I do write about planes, but I write about it. You know, I always say like when my column works the best, I write about a wealthy person who can teach lessons to upper middle class people. I mean, my column isn't meant for maybe some middle class people, but certainly not meant below that. So you can learn how people are living with money. And so how I do it is, you know, I'll write a couple of philanthropy columns and then I'll say, all right, there's nothing again that is moving me in the philanthropy space and I'll switch to something else. Now, in the past two months plus, three months with the coronavirus, I've written an awful lot about entrepreneurs, like one after another. And I'm going to keep doing it because there's just so much to say as these individuals try to figure out how not, you know, to keep their businesses going, but also how to make the right choices around their own lives, but also with their employees. So I don't know when I'll stop writing about entrepreneurs, probably when things you know turn a corner, but some is dictated by, I want to tell a good story. It's August. Nobody wants to read a tax column. They want to read something <laughs> right. kind of fun. Uh, or it's, you know, this just happened in the news this week. I really should write about this new bit of legislation and, and how it's going to affect people. Let's go back to the book a little bit. You talk about some of the mistakes that rich people make or the traps they fall into. And you write about Darien, Connecticut, which is a beautiful place full of men wearing Peter Millar and women wearing Lily Pulitzer. They're also carrying around boatloads of debt. Is that just part of the culture there? Or is that something in common that a trap so many people fall into all over the country? I live one town over from Darien, Connecticut, and I have many friends who live there. And every one of them who reads that chapter says, why, why'd you have to pick on Darien? Well, why would you? And so so just, convenient. That's why. It's right there. I could just drive my car over there and park and just watch. Uh, you know, like Cliff Gertz, like an anthropologist in Darien. It's great. For the record, it could be Winnetka. It could be there any number of, it could be Boca Raton. There any number of, it could be Buckhead in Atlanta. I mean, no, like, no, 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 no. Good Southern people pay their bills, damn it. <laughs> um, it could be any one of those towns or, you know, suburbs. But the point of it was, I mean, look, stuff is expensive and you go there and it's a beautiful town and every part of it is beautiful, but some parts are even more beautiful. So like the entry level house is a million five, a million seven. And it's great by anybody else's standards, unless you look around Darianne and then it's pretty shitty. So you're like, I'm going to pay a million seven for that shitty house. I want to go get <laughs> the two and a half million dollar house. Right. Three million. Now, is that a better house? Of course it is. But once you get down by the water, there's this neighborhood called Tokenique. It's incredible. Like, I would like <laughs> to live there. I just don't have $11 million for a house. It becomes this, this cycle of, okay, if the house is that expensive, well, if someplace else in the world it costs $20,000 to join a country club, it costs $120,000 in Darien. If someplace else in the world it costs $20,000 to send your kid to private school, it costs $45,000 a year. So everything is more expensive. But the problem is, there is this almost exact correlation between what people do and the economy. The majority of people there are somehow going to work in financial services because that's the only way you can make the sort of outsized salaries that are going to allow you to buy those houses, have that lifestyle, have three, four kids, the giant cars that allow you to transport them around. And when things go bad, and that's part of the chapter, when things go bad on Wall Street, 
they go really bad. Yeah. Because if you're a guy, even if you're making $5 million, your base salary is probably $250,000, $300,000. So your whole life is leveraged. And if that bonus doesn't come in, you're literally screwed. You have to start making choices to how I'm going to pay. And that's where the mentality gets completely screwed, skewed, because a bonus is a bonus. One year you could get a $500,000 bonus. The next year you could get a $5 million bonus. Now, a person who was on top of their choices and thinking with a wealth mindset and not the, the rich mindset would say, wait a second, why don't I save some portion of that and uh, you know, wait a couple of years before I buy a bigger house? But you just got your big bonus and you're looking and you say, I want that house. I want to go from a million five to $3.5 million. And then as we talked about before, you walk into that house and you say, holy shit, it costs $50,000 for drapes. And then the cycle just keeps <laughs> repeating itself. You're like, where did my bonus go? So how does one keep themselves from getting trapped in that cycle? Do you allow yourself to drink Bordeaux? Read my book. Yeah. No, that's how they do it. The Bordeaux dilemma. I love it. So this is part of that chapter. The Bordeaux dilemma, and this goes back to what I was joking about, you know, saving your $4 for your Starbucks coffee every day. The Bordeaux dilemma is, for my wife, who's from Atlanta, her favorite wine is Chateau Margaux. Good choice. Great. Amazing choice. It's not like, you know... Uh, Bartles and James, which that would be a lot cheaper. I used to sell that. <laughs> My first job out of college. Oh, that's good. Just sit on the porch, sip in your wine cooler. Anyway, that's taking me back to, but the Bordeaux dilemma, the Chateau Margaux, it's a good bottle, not a great bottle, is three, four, five hundred dollars. A great bottle is thousands of dollars. But once you've had Chateau Margaux, everything else, greatest California wine, tastes awful or not awful. It just tastes less mm. and you get hooked. But I talk about it in the book is that, you know, my wife and I, you know, <laughs> we used to do this more before we started adding on to our family, but we would have a, a bottle of Chateau Margaux at our anniversary. And it was something that was very conscious and we enjoyed it and it was great, but we knew that, you know, we couldn't have it every week. Or if we had it every week, there's so many other things in our life that we couldn't do. Public school, point, public school, public school, public yeah, school, no mountain house, <laughs> forget it. But everybody has that Chateau Margaux in their life. Now, if you're a billionaire, you can drink Chateau Margaux for breakfast if you want. You could floss, you could mouth, use it as mouthwash, it won't matter. <laughs> but there's something in your life that is that Bordeaux dilemma. Maybe it is a private jet. Maybe you would really like to fly private. At some level, except if you're Jeff Bezos, except when you get above you know, that super billionaire class, you have to make decisions around money. And so I use that great bottle of wine as a way to illustrate that you can still have these things that are expensive, but you just have to make choices and trade off on the other end. So what's your Wednesday night wine? What's my Wednesday night wine? Depends, you know, if it's, uh, if it's summertime or having a steak, it may just be like a little whispering angel, which is a little rosé, which is nice. I think it's about 20. It's very popular years. among the ladies in uh, Buckhead. Very, yeah. yeah, very, very popular in, in New Canaan and Darien as well. <laughs> uh, if it's a, you know, fish, we a Sonoma Couture. That's another one. Right. Yeah. So a 25 but, to $30 bottle of wine, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The decoy Cabernet is drinkable. You know, uh, too, too sweet. it's too sweet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, too sweet. I have a horrible palate, but don't even get I, me started on conundrum. My wife loves. Conundrum. Oh no, that stuff is way too sweet. It's, it's, too it's sweet. terribly it's sweet. sweet. No, no, no. There is no conundrum here. It's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> One person you quoted in the book, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was, but stated is their financial philosophy was don't live like a king for a while, live like a prince forever. And I was like that. That is yep. what people should keep in mind, that you have the opportunity for this thing to last, do it at 90% forever or do it at 100% for 10 years and it's over. And the best part, that guy's Adam Carriker, who was an NFL player. I, I doubt he's still in the league now because he was in his 30s when I talked to him. And he illustrated that he had, you know, I think he'd gone to St. Louis. I'll, I'll screw that up. But he'd gone to one team and he was a first round draft pick, you know, 10 million bucks guaranteed no matter what for his first contract. But he realized that if he'd gone to St. Louis or wherever the first team was and bought the $4 million house, if he got traded, which is exactly what happened to him, who would buy that $4 million house? You'd have to find another football player who had that kind of money to buy the house. And so he was always trying to be a little more modest. The NFL gets knocked all the time for how players blow through money, but 
the NFL Players Association is trying to do its best, and they're doing yeoman's work, to help these young kids, 21 years old, 20, 21, 22, who come out, and even the league minimum guys are getting seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, to try to help them realize that you've got to pay taxes, you've got to pay your agent, you're going to be done in three years, or if you're lucky, 10 years. Right. You're not going beyond that. And so that was his whole philosophy, like how to manage what he had so that he would have choices later on in life. If he wanted to go and be, become an investment banker after he retired, great. If he wanted to go become a high school football coach after he retired, great. He'd have the choice to do whatever he wanted. You talk about a few different kinds of wealthy slash rich people. The first is the category I believe I fall into, which is a dissipator. What, what's that? A <laughs> dissipator gets a giant sum of money somehow, either an inheritance or working for a technology company that does really well. And that's it. And that's the sum. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to maintain it because the chances of you making that money back or getting that same pile of money again aren't great. And so you just have to budget. You have to go through. And and it happens. I I used to use the example of NFL players. They get the same thing. They get a giant slug of money and they have to somehow stretch it out for an indeterminate amount of time. Right. As opposed to accumulators or make and spenders. Yeah, accumulators, I don't think they exist anymore, accumulators. That was, you know, my grandfather's generation who he worked in the post office. I can't imagine he ever made more than $20,000 a year. And at one point we looked at his bank account and he, he had like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 in there. Yeah. Like, I don't even know how that's you know possible on, on that salary. He never spent anything. And, and that's, that gave him comfort. He lived through the Great Depression. You can understand why that money script allowed him to do that, but he didn't have the joy. And then the third one you mentioned, the making spenders, that's most people. That's people making trade-offs every single day. And they're with imperfect information. You know, my base salary is X. Will it continue forever? I hope so. But a lot of people thought that. And we now have almost 40 million people unemployed, you know, when we're talking now in in May because of the coronavirus. So all of those people had to re-engineer their choices. But that's most people who make money and spend it and are trying to you know, both enjoy their lives, but hopefully put something aside for down the road if they lose their jobs or or hopefully if they just want to retire in X number of years. Now, this is my favorite category and I had to look it up because, because I'm not that smart, a flaneur. Am I saying that right? You are. I mean, because every book to be taken seriously needs a (laughs) fancy French word in it. uh, For the listeners at home, it's F-L-A-N-E-U-R-S which I was listening to Paul's book on audio. Sorry, I think that's cheating, but I do that sometimes. <laughs> but uh, a, a flaneur, what is a flaneur? It's a wanderer in the city. That, that is the actual definition, a wanderer in the city. But I talk about it in my chapter on how people inherit money. And that's essentially the easiest way to put it. Somebody who's just completely unconscious, brain dead, no sense of how they have this money. And the example I use is this guy who's you know, crying poor mouth because he, you know, only inherited $45 million. And, and how is he going to, you know, get by? How do you thing? live on that? My gosh. A lot of Chateau Margot. It just That's goes right. like that. Yeah. How do I make sure my kid doesn't end up like that? First of all, by the way, two things. One, if I know he's going to join resource generation, he's getting Zippo to start with. Okay. Like <laughs> resource generation. I was like, I'm dying poor. I'm dying broke. There's I'm, he's, if, if anybody's going to give the money away, it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually a lot easier than people think, but it requires a level of honesty and self-confidence and self-assuredness. So when your child asks you, daddy, you know, are we rich? Well, that, that's easy. You can you can always punt on that one. It's relative, blah, blah, blah. But when they ask, like, how much, you know, you never lie to them, but how much do things cost? Or, you know, I went into, kids live in this comparative bubble. You know, your house, they love your house. It's the house they know. But they're going to walk into their friend's house, and immediately that house is going to be bigger or smaller than your house. It can't be any, it's going to be different somehow. And when they come home and ask those questions, you have to be prepared to answer them honestly. People make different choices. That's more important to them. It's the same thing with, you know, how much are our mommy and daddy rich? How much do mommy and daddy make? And you talk to them about how you work and you connect money to labor. You connect money to choices. What people often do is they freeze and they say, why are you asking me that? You know, there's so many great examples of people who, it's a simple question. Kids just want to know, how much does a car cost? How much does our car cost? Now, if you live in New Canaan, Connecticut, you're not allowed to live here if you don't have a foreign car. Like, they clearly, like, clearly, yeah. as it should be. 
you just, but you have to understand that coming in. So every car, every day I joke in the New Canaan train station before this happened, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of cars that just sit there. But if your kid says to you, hey, dad, how much does my car cost? You don't want to say our car costs $50,000 or $60,000. They won't understand it. So what I came up with, at least for my own kids, I've got three daughters, is I started talking about money in terms of Barbie dolls. So a Barbie doll at our local toy store, simple, basic Barbie, not Barbie with a doll, not Barbie with a scooter, just a Barbie, was $10. So I start talking to her and the number of Barbies you have to have to trade Barbies for a car. And that helped her connect money and value. And you know, little tricks like that work really well. But the key thing is to answer the questions honestly with short answers and then shut up. And I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a personal story. My daughter came home. My oldest daughter came home and said, Daddy, I got to tell you something. I'm really, you know, I know your mom work really hard and, and we get to go to good schools and I don't want to sound ungrateful, but how come we don't have a movie theater in our house? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Movie there? What are you movie there? She, well, she said, well, Dad, every one of my friends has a movie theater. Like, what are you talking about? This guy can't believe it. Every one of your friends does not have a movie theater. She then proceeded to list every one of her friends, and they have movie theaters. Like, so I was like, all right, okay. But, but I freaked out because I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm raising this rich, entitled, spoiled child who thinks she deserves a movie theater in her house when she just was – asking you a basic question, all of her friends, her five closest friends, they honestly have movie theaters in their house with the nice chairs and everything. I get it. No, I've seen them. Yeah. I've seen and them. so you're like, and so then I, then, then once I calmed down and like my face wasn't beat red anymore, I explained, you know, well, you know, that, that is, you know, choices they make. And she's heard this spiel enough that she understands that people make choices with their money. And, you know, we spend more money on dogs and cats and, and we like to take trips and, and they like to, as a family, have a, a movie theater. And, and she accepts that. I think what I would have done in your role there was to disparage the other parents <laughs> would be to, oh, yeah, well, you know how much debt he's carrying right now? <laughs> no, I was very proud to come home to my hometown and buy a big house. And I'm, you know, so proud to raise my kids in a nice environment. And then when my son was seven, he came home from another one of his good friend's houses and he said, hey, dad, when are we going to hire a chef? And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? It's my cooking. That that's fast. actually, that's actually a bit I do on stage. And so I'm not going to do it for free here, Paul. You're gonna have to pay $16 when clubs reopen in 2022 to hear me do that live. Just a couple more questions. I have to ask about 20 years ago, you're standing on a train platform in Springfield, Massachusetts. How does your day get more interesting from there? I look up from my train ticket to make sure I'm on the right platform. And I see standing in front of me, the most brilliant curly shock of gray brown hair. And I look, I said, geez, that's the kind of hair that, that Kurt Vonnegut might have. And then I look a little closer and I said, that's Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut is standing on the train platform in Springfield. What the hell is Kurt Vonnegut doing in Springfield, Massachusetts? So we get on the train. And he's in a different car. And I remember this. I had just started at the Financial Times and I had a business card and my mom, one business card, and my mom wanted it. And I said, Mom, give me that business card back. And she says, Why? And I says, and she's not a super literary person. I was like, that's Kurt Vonnegut. I was like, I don't know, the guy with the crazy hair. I was like, that's Kurt Vonnegut. And so I sit down, I run back, and I go to talk to him. And in his book, Cat's Cradle, he has this thing called the Grand Falloon, which is, you know. The, the false connection. Let's pretend you and I grew up in Buckhead together and we meet in San Francisco and like, I can't believe we grew up in Buckhead. That doesn't mean anything. You know, we don't have you know, any real connection. And Vonnegut and I both went to the University of Chicago in PhD programs and both realized after a year or so, this isn't for us. Get me the hell out of here. And so I go back to Vonnegut and I introduce myself and he just kind of stares at me and I said, but Mr. Vonnegut, you and I, Chicago, and he slides over. And I can't believe like the Grand Falloon works on the man who invented the Grand <laughs> Falloon. And then we sit and I, you know, and at the time the FT still has it every, and the weekend FT, they have something called, you know, lunch with the FT. So said, this can be a train ride with the FT. And so I scribble down everything and, I, and we talk for 45 minutes. And at the end, any more quiet, anything else? Nope. Kicks me out. I don't care. I go back to my seat, call my, editor. this is wonderful. Now I'm 27 years old now, new on the job at the FT. 
don't understand how it works. My first big newspaper job from, you know, where I started off, you know, and I file the story and then a week or two goes by and it doesn't run. And so I think to myself, well, why hasn't it run? You know, I don't understand that people around the world are writing these stories and it takes time for it to run. And so I say to the deputy editor, I say, you know, I got to be honest with you. Vonnegut didn't look great. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm not saying he's dying. I'm not saying he's dying. I just don't think we should hold this story right. for too long because, you know, I don't know how healthy he is. I mean, he's old, he's firing. It's not like, oh, okay. okay. Next morning, 6 a.m., my phone rings in my apartment and it's uh, this woman and the other. And she says, Paul Sullivan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is so-and-so, uh, the obituaries editor at the FT. I understand that you are our expert on Vonnegut and that he's about to die. Oh, That's, no. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's even worse than what I thought you were going to tell me. Oh, oh no. Gets, and, and she says, we need you to write an obituary for him because we need to have this. Because every newspaper sure. has a whole stack of Re- yeah, ready to go. Obituary ready to go. And I said, oh, shit. Have I got myself into a whole heap? You know, I'm like three months on the job. I go out, I buy five Vonnegut books, I buy a biography of him, I start reading him. I, I do all this stuff and I write this obituary of Vonnegut. The story runs, it goes great. I stay at the FT another seven years. Vonnegut lives another eight years from when I met him. And then finally one day, he dies. He dies, just natural cause. He's in his 80s, whatever he was. And I remember calling the then US editor who's just stepped down, Lionel. And I said, uh, you know, Lionel, and Lionel, if he's listening, I, I admire the guy so much, but we always joke that he was playing himself in the movie version of his life. And I called him <laughs> up and I said, you know, I just want to let you know, I wrote the Vonnegut obit back in 2000. He just died. And Lionel says, all right. I called over and I said, we got the obit ready. Sullivan wrote it. Run it. And it was like right out of a movie. That's and hilarious. That was my first big piece for the FT. And my absolute last piece for the FT was both the book ends on Vonnegut. That's a fantastic story. So speaking of other publications you write for, you're a columnist for Golf Magazine. What's your index, first of all? 7.9. All right. So you can play. Now I'm going to ask a question that merges both financial wisdom and golf. How quickly would my wife divorce me if I joined a second country club? Depends if it was like local or national. My column this month is talking about all these national memberships where you can get for a lot less money. They're far away. So she might not really know. You, you <laughs> no, I'm not a member. I'm not. I don't know why it says <laughs> member on the envelope. I don't know what it does. I'm just going to, I'm just going to Nebraska. You, got, you can get the bill emailed to you. You don't even need paper anymore. The bill just emails. This is every golfer who loves his wife goes through this where I never get the time right. I always say, I'm going to go play golf. I'll I'll be back in five hours. Never, ever, ever, ever. And then I start, you know, it's like, you can never get this right. So I think you should do it, but it should be, you know, far away. All right. A couple of personal questions and I'll let you go. In your book and in your writing, you talk about some things that could be construed as you having a conservative point of view on things around taxes and the nature of inequality. Do you get along with the rest of the editorial staff at the New York Times, or is it just like you and David Brooks by yourselves in a corner of the cafeteria <laughs> talking about <laughs> talking about like Chicago? Where's, we can- where's the bone china for my tea? God damn it. I'm not going to have it in a solo cup. Come on. Even. Uh, I don't know. I've never, I don't think I've ever been called conservative before. I think when it comes to taxes, I'm sort of a rationalist. We want to pay for things. We have to figure out how to fund them. And I think that the chapter on taxes talks about, you put me on the defensive here. Like, I think I'm a pretty. You didn't realize this was hardball, did you? I was like, just middle this- road guy. And I think, you know, look, tax policy is tax policy. And, you know, you can make income all kinds of different ways and it, and it gets taxed all kinds of different ways. But yeah, I think I get along with people. I don't know. I feel like Stuart Smalley now. I think they like me. I do my best. There's so much talk about political polarity in the media. So I just thought I'd throw that out there and see what the mood is like in newsrooms yeah, around just the world. Stoke the fire. Cause this isn't a tough time in the world. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> no, journalism's never been more lucrative. What are you talking yeah, about? Everyone loves journalists. Come on. I think we've talked about your values. You want to pass along to your children. Is there anything else you want to add as to what you hope for them and their relationship with money? Yeah, I just hope they realize that they can do whatever they want as long as they understand their choices. And it's a serious point, but it came out of a funny story when one of my daughters said, you know, Daddy, I want to be a school teacher. And I, I think she'd be a great school teacher. And I said, I think that's great. But, you know, that's what I do. Worry towards. Yeah, I want to be a school teacher. 
And I want to live on a vineyard in California <laughs> and have a horse. And I was like, okay. You can't even do one of those things. You can't even no, have a horse. No, no I, I don't listen to her. But then, she's a smart kid. And then she says, you know, but I'm thinking I might marry a spinal surgeon. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess it all works out. Like, you know, but the, the, the whole process, and she's too young for me to like come down hard on her. But it's like, you can do different things, but like, you know, mommy and daddy live this life because of what we do. And we can live a different life. We did different things. Same as you and, you know, your kids at the house. But it is that type of making them aware that if they want to be an investment banker, they'll have to work certain hours and do certain things. And they'll have more money than the sister that is the teacher. But as long as you're conscious about that, both people can be on the right side of the thing. To mind. Spinal surgeon is frighteningly specific, by the way. <laughs> it's because we bought our first house from a spinal surgeon. Oh, you so did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there was some reason. Okay, go. I was like, what is she watching? <laughs> you better she check. She has that at HSS. She likes the hospital for special surgery, you know. That's yeah. right. That's right. Okay, so we talked a lot about both about you growing up working class and the relative nature of wealth that our kids are experiencing. Does writing about the ultra rich and successful people make you feel relatively less affluent or is it a reminder to be grateful for all that you've achieved in your life? I think I'm really fortunate and more fortunate than a lot of people because I have a sense of enough. And when I was 27 and I'm 47 now, when I was 27 and got a job working for the FT, that was the pinnacle for me. Like I, I didn't ever think that I would be able to do that. And I always dreamt of writing for the New York Times, but I just didn't think it was, you know, realistic. And so I understand like what I do pays a certain amount of money and it gives me a certain amount of freedom. And to earn more money, I'd have to give up some of the freedom, you know, earn less, I could have more. And so I've been able to balance it as, as best I can, but I have a sense of enough. So I don't look and say, boy, I hope to, you know, have a goal stream. I have friends go Gulf streams and sometimes they take me on their plan and that's awesome. That's the best. <laughs> that's a friend with a boat, but like I'm under no illusions that there's anything that my wife and I could ever do to allow us to buy a private jet. But when she asked me when we we're away, if we won a lottery, would you do anything differently? And I knew she wanted me to say, I do this, this, and this. And I wouldn't like, I wouldn't do anything differently. And I think it drives her crazy because I would keep writing. I keep doing what I'm doing. I could have a hundred million dollars in the bank from a lottery winning. I do something. I do everything that I do now. And then I paused and I said, you know what I would do? I'd get net jets. We'd fly private. That's what I would do. But yeah, I just have a sense of enough. So I don't begrudge anybody their success. I'm, I'm just fascinated by it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a perfect place to end it. Except one more question. What's a $25 Cabernet I should go buy tonight? You retail, retail at the grocery store. $25 at the grocery store. I think you could get the Honig. The Honig Cabernet would be about 25. If we're in a, a pandemic and I was going to the grocery store and you have all kinds of great wines that are on sale now. They knock like four or five bucks off it. You get it right for 25, the honey. That's what I There get. you go. There you go. You're, the more you drink, the more you save. I like your attitude. <laughs> Paul Sullivan, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Where can our listeners find out more about you online? PaulJSullivan.com. PaulJSullivan.com is my website. Go there. All right, cool. We'll put that link in the notes. Thanks again, Paul. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and appreciate you making time for it. Folks, you can see in the show notes, the link to his website, pauljsullivan.com, where you can go find out more about his writing on golf.com and on the New York Times, or you can click and find yourself a copy of one of his books. I do love when I get to talk to people whose writing I've read for an extended period of time, and then I get to find out what their personality is like one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't know from all his writing that Paul was a little bit of a smart ass and kind of a cut up. So I thought that was really fun and appreciate him bringing his whole personality to the show. That was fun. Whenever I listen to a rough cut of the interview, I'll do the interview and sometimes it's weeks in between when we did the interview. Sometimes it's weeks between when we did the interview and when we post it. And so I'll go back and listen and be like, oh yeah, that's what we talked about. This one wasn't that long ago. But as I was listening back to it, there was a place where he's talking about his daughter wanted that movie theater in her house. And I was like, um, and he was explaining how he was rationalizing it to like, we could have it, but and I wanted to say, because mommy's got a Chateau Margot problem. That's why. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I thought that would have been funny to, to interject there. By the way, that Honig cab is good. I didn't find it for anywhere close to $25. It was closer to like 38, I think, at my local wine shop. But anyway, it was a good bottle of wine. I think he's right. I hold fast on my conviction about conundrum. However, that it doesn't work with my, my highly refined palate, which 
Yes, I've been training as a sommelier for years. I'm just kidding. I do enjoy the wine. I like what I like and I don't like what I don't like. So there you go. Hey folks, I would greatly appreciate it if you take a minute to rate and review the show. You generally do that. If you're listening to it on a phone, you can scroll down to the bottom of your Apple podcast app and you can see rate and review, click some stars, click a lot of stars, click all five stars and write something nice and thoughtful about what you're getting from crazy money as a listener. I really would appreciate it. Next week, I've got a great interview to share with you with Carol Graham from the Brookings Institution. She's written books about happy peasants and miserable millionaires. What can we learn from people who are happy, who have nothing, and from people who have everything and are crabby sons of bitches? What can we learn? Find out next week on Crazy Money. As always, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.